and it was an older congregation in both churches, and they used to say all the time, our little pastor's wife, our little pastor's wife. And that's exactly how they treated me. So I had no problems. I was totally, you know, in good hands in every respect. Now here I am thrust into a position where people are having all kinds of problems and they are coming to me with those problems. And they really made me feel like somewhere down the road, I'm really going to be where they are. I'm thinking to myself, it must just be like this. So somewhere down the road, I'm going to need somebody to go to that's going to help me work through all of the kind of problems that they're bringing to me. But one of the things that the late mother Ethel Mae Bonner shared with me before I was married. She spent a full day with me. That morning before lunch, she told me all the wonderful things about being the preacher's wife. You get to travel, you get a good seat wherever you go, you get the best seat. You know, people call your name. She told me all those good things. After lunch, she said, take off your jacket. And you, those of you who knew Mother Bonner knew, she said, take off your jacket, and now we're going to have a woman to woman. And the first thing she said to me is that he is just a meat man. <laughs> and what she meant by that is, though everybody else sees your companion as God's man, full of the spirit, can do no wrong. You pick up the dirty socks, she told me. She said, you wash all the dirty clothes. So to you, he's a meat man. And one thing that she encouraged me to do was not to lose your identity. She says, as you sit as the leadership of that congregation, of that house, you're, you're the channel of blessings for many, many people. People will come into the congregation that are young adults that never knew their father, that never knew of a relationship with a father, yet they're going to come in and marry one of your spiritual sons. You are the channel, that model, that shows them what a father should be, or what a mother should be. So the clergy couple was intended to be a channel of blessings, but now within that relationship between that clergy couple, the fresh water ceases to flow. All of those outside challenges, um, and, and you all know that you have um, gotten up on a Sunday morning and everything that could go wrong went wrong. And you thought it was his fault and he thought it was your fault. But you got to step inside that church and face that congregation. And you're so mad at him, you don't want to see his face. But you have to sit in that pew and hear that message. And you all can look at me like you don't know anything about that at all. Um, and I hope you all don't think that I'm being very liberal with my teaching because my husband is not here. But he heard for 39 years everything that you're going to hear today. And um, we used to commute from the Bronx, New York, up to Hartford, Connecticut for a good 15 years. We made that commute every week, sometimes two three times during the week. I'm dressed, the kids are wasting food, my husband is following the car too close, it's everything that just makes you totally unfrazzled. And by the time you get there, you wish you had stayed home. And the minute you step out of the car, well, Sister Johnson, Sister Johnson, 
I don't want to counsel anybody. I need counseling. <laughs> want to be bothered with anybody, but you, you arise to the occasion. You put on that mask, and you step out, and you act as if the fresh waters are flowing. And you have to pray really hard to receive the message that day, because there were some things that you thought should have been done, some places you thought that you should have gone, that you didn't go. The decisions didn't go your way. But now, your husband is your pastor that's delivering that message. And the more he preaches, the more the congregation is looking at you that's right. to see how you receive his message, to decide how they're going to receive his message. So I felt that it was pretty appropriate for us to talk about the letting the fresh waters flow in our marriages. Now, I'm not going to talk about all the things that I have encountered um, in that role with all of those ministers' wives and, and the ministers but I'm going to get to the point of identifying one area that I want to focus on. Many clergy couples have forsaken their own genuine Christian experience. How did you meet the Lord before you were Sister First Lady? How did you meet the Lord before you were the minister's wife or the deacon's wife? How did you meet the Lord before you were the apostles' wife? And you know that the Lord met you when you went to him. He was there. You know that when you were doing your daily Bible reading and your meditation, that that spe special relationship was there between you and the Lord. But I tend to feel that many clergy couples have forsaken their own genuine Christian experience because they are responsible for so many other people. And it was not what I did. It was what they did that caused me to do what I did that made it not work. It, it wasn't me. But there is confession that each of us has to face day by day. And I'm, I'm gonna take it to scripture, just bear with me a little bit. The clergy couple relationship was intended to be channels of blessings. Clergy couples are intended to be healers. I remember a week ago, a young lady came to me at the end of the service and she said, I really need to talk to you. And um, I said, well, no problem. We'll set up some time to talk. And she said, well, DCF has taken my children all day. <laughs> I'm, I'm not that kind of counselor. Um, she said, and I didn't say that to her, but I was listening. She said, so I think I'll, maybe I'll just talk with the pastor. Well, I knew she didn't need to talk with all the AJ about DCF taking her children. He, he couldn't even resonate with that at all. But you're expected, just expected to be healed. Expected to be healed. Well, let me submit to you that many clergy couples are wounded Healers. Carrying wounds of their own. How do you become a wounded healer? Well, we were two before we became one. And every one of us came into the new house together. Each one of us had our own suitcase. And there are things in that suitcase that is unique to each one of us. What 
developed us into the person that we are today. And I think that um, Mother uh, Gwen Lewis, on yesterday when she was talking to the women, I could see her presentation rolling right into mm -hmm. <clears throat> what I had prepared for couples. Because all of that hurt, all of that hurt, whatever went in to making you who or what you are, is still there, although you become one. You become one with everything that you bring with you. There are wounded healers. There are things that some of you probably sitting in this room right now have never shared with each other. Things that you encountered in life before you even met each other and it has a direct impact on who you are and the model that you present right now to that congregation, but you've never shared it with each other. They're wounded healers. Mm -hmm.